So what exactly is a Pokemon? Cute, cuddly characters who become supercharged so they can fight their enemies. But some experts say the entire Pokemon phenomenon is the enemy. In my opinion, parents should not let their kids watch Pokemon, play Pokemon, buy Pokemon cards, have anything whatsoever to do with Pokemon, because the message is violence. But many parents disagree. It's really, I think, an okay thing for the kids because they learn to save their allowance to budget for it and they learn to trade and be kind of reasonable with their friends. Hey y'all, today I'll be talking about a topic that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, Pokemon. This beloved game series has been around for decades and is still as popular today as it ever was, really. From the original red and blue versions to more recent titles like Scarlet and Violet, there's something out there for every kind of Pokemon fan. So today I'm going to take you on a journey through the history of this incredible game series, exploring its evolution over time and uncovering some lost media along the way. So let's just jump into it. It has become a global marketing phenomenon. Pokemon has captured the imagination of children around the world and billions and billions of dollars from their parents' wallets. It's now so pervasive, schools have banned Pokemon in the playgrounds. But while adults might be mystified, might tut-tut about unhealthy obsessions and manipulation, there's no escaping Pokemon, the biggest thing for kids since Mickey Mouse. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to be taking a look at the history of Pokemon. The first installment in the series was released in 1996 in Japan, and since then has grown into an international phenomenon. It spawned multiple movies, TV shows, card games, toys, books, and much more. But what makes this game so special? What keeps people coming back time after time? Let's start by taking a look at the original game itself. The first two titles were Pokemon Red and Green, which was released exclusively in Japan in 1996. These games featured 151 unique species of Pokemon for players to capture, train, and battle with. The goal of the game was simple, become the best trainer by catching all 151 Pokemon and defeating the Elite Four at the end of the game. Although these games had limited graphics compared to modern titles, they still managed to captivate players with their innovative gameplay mechanics such as Pokeballs and battle systems. The success of Red and Green led to two more main series titles being released, the blue version in Japan only in 1996 and the yellow version released worldwide in 1998. Pokemon Yellow added some new features such as Pikachu following you around outside of battles which further increased its popularity worldwide. This period is often considered one of the golden ages for Pokemon fans as it marked a surge in both sales and critical acclaim for the franchise. Since then there have been numerous sequels released over various platforms such as Game Boy Advance, Nintendo DS slash 3DS, and Nintendo Switch. Each successive installment has added something new while also refining existing features such as graphics, battle systems, or interactions with your Pokemon. For instance, Ruby and Sapphire introduced double battles while HeartGold and SoulSilver brought back classic characters from previous games like Mewtwo or Lugia among others. All these additions have kept fans engaged throughout each generation while also providing newcomers with an easy entry point into the franchise. Aside from the main series titles, there have also been many spin-off games released over time, such as Pokemon Go, Rumble Blast, or Mystery Dungeon, which explore different aspects of this world while remaining faithful to its core mechanics. In addition to this, there are also card games like Pokemon Trading Card Game, where players can build decks using their favorite characters from across generations and compete against other trainers online or offline tournaments respectively. All these elements combine to form an experience that appeals to both casual gamers as well as hardcore fans alike, making it one of the most successful video game franchises ever created. While there is a seemingly endless amount of content to enjoy, some projects were never released and some have just been lost to time. So with that said, let's talk about the wide array of Pokemon Lost Media. And since this is most likely going to be a longer video, or perhaps the longest video I've made so far, I recommend grabbing a snack, some water, warm tea, and just getting comfortable.
Back in the early 2000s to early 2010s, Pokemon.com had many games you could play on their website, just like many other franchises. With the takedown of Flash in December 2020, some of the games from the site have gone missing, while others have shown up in some capacity. The site also wasn't archived well, so there may be more missing than we thought, or vice versa. As far as we know, the games missing are as follows. Tricks of a Trainer A quiz where you answer questions about the Hoenn region that went missing after the January 11th, 2010 revamp. Grassmatas, a grass-type Pokemon crossword puzzle and move puzzle that also went missing at the same time, and Deep Sea Diving, a name game of sorts featuring water-type Pokemon, Tic-Tac-Toe, which is pretty self-explanatory but was hidden and required a specific address to find it, an unnamed shuckle game that was a memory game where the player had to find the hidden shiny shuckle, Wapifet's Puzzle Pack, a set of Jigsaw puzzles that was changed into a Zora pack, and the last game known to be missing, Befriend a Pokemon. It was part of a promotion where players could receive an evolution through Pokemon's global link, though it required an account to the Pokemon Trainer Club to access, and went missing after the promotion ended. Using the Wayback Machine, you can find the Pokemon Fun Zone, where most of the games could be played back in 2010, but are unplayable unless you have a Flash emulator. As far as other evidence, we have people commenting on their memories of the games and two screenshots, one from Wobbuffet's Puzzle Pack and Befriend a Pokemon. At Nintendo Space World 2000, Shigeru Miyamoto, one of the top video game designers for Nintendo, showed off a demo at the end of his GameCube presentation, known as Meow's Party. According to development, they had taken sequences from the anime to turn it into an interactive 3D show, showing off some of the GameCube's capabilities, and while it wasn't perfect, it was impressive. Despite the frame rate issues and other demos being shown that looked better than Mouse Party, the Pokemon looked well rendered and the disco lighting was well done. While the demo came as a pleasant surprise, Nintendo hasn't acknowledged whether Mouse Party was just for a show or evidence of a game underway, even though the Pokemon Stadium 64 team developed it. The demo was eventually worked into Pokemon Channel, at the end of the in-game cartoon Pichu Bros and Party Panic, but hasn't resurfaced since then. The original tech demo hasn't yet surfaced anywhere online, and no one knows what the demo had for playability. For now, all we have is some short videos and pictures of the demo. On December 31st, 1997, an hour-long special known as It's New Year's Eve Pocket Monsters Encore was scheduled to air, yet wound up being cancelled due to the fallout and four-month hiatus from the Porygon incident. A similar special aired two years later, and it's fair to assume that some footage from the cancelled special was reworked into the new special. While regular episodes of the anime have been banned or gone missing over time, the special had its own time slot and was supposed to stand out from the regular series. There is no known footage or photos from the 1997 special, but it's assumed that it was reworked into the two-hour special aired in 1999, cutting out the infamous incident. In my opinion, it's unlikely that the original special will be found, but sometimes the most unexpected pieces are found in strange places, so who knows? While Pokemon the first movie is one of the highest grossing Japanese films of all time, there are some stark differences between what was planned and what we got, with both theatrical and home media releases. Before the movie's release, there was a 10-minute radio drama titled The Birth of Mewtwo broadcast in five parts on Inoko Inuyama's Pokemon Hour, a show on Nippon Broadcasting System for the Greater Tokyo area between June 7, 1998 to July 12, 1998. The program gives us the story of Mewtwo and his origin, along with some Pokemon history and how Mewtwo came to believe that it was the only Pokemon that could rule the world. When looking at Takashi Shudo's, a writer for the main series and the first movie's blog, the radio drama was written after finishing the script for the first movie. It was atypical for Shudo to write story pitches, usually working on them from start to finish, but due to the number of people involved with Pokemon, he decided to write it. Birth of Mewtwo was eventually released as a two CD set on February 12, 1999, and an animated adaptation was made for Mewtwo Strikes Back, The Kanzenbon, which was a special edition of the first movie prepared for the North American release. It debuted in Japan on July 8, 1999, when TV Tokyo aired the adaptation to promote the next movie, Revolution Lugia. While it hits the important points from the drama, it is pretty condensed when compared to the radio drama, as the drama is an hour long and the special is only 10 minutes. 
There are many changes, but I can mention a couple I found on Dogosu's backpack, a fan site that's been around for 23 years. The first episode was skipped over in the special, along with Miyamoto's reports heard at the end of each episode, Mew and the Kentonian starters. The last known deleted scene shows a young Mewtwo communicating with both the Kanto starters and Amber's clone Amber 2 telepathically before Amber 2's death later on, making this the first instance of a human passing away in the Pokemon series. Another mystery revolving around the first movie is the trailers. An early trailer aired in theaters sometime in early 1998, thought to be during the company's four-month hiatus, featured scenes that were nothing like the movie that was released, though that practice was common at the time and is still used today. Anyways, the trailer depicted two women, one being Voyager, one that looks like Misty, even though it isn't, and a little girl cloud-gazing as they turn into various Pokemon. It ends with the woman's voice saying, the first movie will be released in theaters this July, but no exact date. Lastly, some white text says the movie doesn't feature any extreme scenes, probably trying to ease the worries of parents following the shock of the Porygon incident. This, along with a couple other early trailers, had footage that never wound up used in the movie, and Takashi Shiro did give some insight as to why. He said, quote, It's been pointed out that there are scenes in the trailers that aren't in the actual movie itself. Since the movie's running time is calculated from the storyboards, we don't end up having a lot of leftover scenes like they do in live-action movies. As you can imagine, the more scenes we end up not using, the more time and money we have to waste. The aforementioned storyboard is made from the final draft of the script, so any scenes you see in the trailer that don't up in the actual movie should be thought of as promotional scenes made before the script was finished." End quote. So they were made to generate hype, but they hadn't finished enough of the movie to show off in trailers in that time. The first trailer is still a mystery in the Pokemon and Lost Media community, only being available on YouTube or Nico Nico Video, never being officially released on any DVD slash Blu-ray, and no higher quality version is known to exist. Overall, the movie has a complicated history, yet is one of the greatest Pokemon movies ever made in my opinion. <laughs> And if you want to hear a deep dive into the history of the movie, let me know down below. Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Red and Blue Rescue Team are a pair of Game Boy Advance games released in 2005 in Japan and 2006 in North America. During the early days of its release, a website operating on Adobe Flash was made featuring some mini-games and bonus content. It contains six sections, Rescue Team 101, Rescue Missions, The Story, Pokemon Square, and Fun Stuff. However, when Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Explorers of Time and Darkness was released, the site was changed and all the content that was originally there went missing. The only archive of the original site that still works is the Australian version of the site that was active until 2016, and only the Rescue 101 tab is archived, but the only content in it that survived is a fresh start. An image from the Fun Stuff comic creator exists thanks to DeviantArt easier. I'm probably gonna say this completely wrong. Kirby P Help SBK, <laughs> but the feature itself is still missing. The only mini game recovered has been the personality quiz, as it was uploaded to Flashpoint on June eighth, twenty twenty. It's unknown just how much is lost since the site isn't fully archived, but the efforts to recover the lost content are respected and admired. And kudos to those putting in the hard work to bring back these nostalgic pieces of our childhood. Battle of the Quaking Island, Barbaroche vs. Wishcash was supposed to be the 375th episode of the anime, set to premiere on November 4th, 2004, but it wound up never airing due to the Chuhetsu earthquake that same year. The episode revolved around Ash and friends stopping by Jojo Island while heading towards the Sotopolis gym and getting caught in an earthquake Wishcash caused. Later on, they met with another trader, Chota, who helps in stopping Wishcash. As I said previously, it was supposed to air in November, yet it was pulled from the broadcast schedule two weeks before the premiere following the natural disaster. Originally, it was postponed but would change to discontinued, as Japan typically doesn't want to air context suggesting natural disasters, and that's happened more than once with Pokemon episodes. It's unlikely that the episode will ever be released, and it's now one of five banned episodes that haven't seen the light of day. The only footage we have is a 35 second preview that can be found on YouTube. Also known as Pokemon 3D Adventure Find Mew, it's one of their 3D animated films where Pikachu and friends set out to find the ever so elusive Mew. It was first shown at the temporary Poke Park in Nagoya, Japan, between March 2005 to September of the same year when the park closed, 
It reappeared in 2009, airing in a limited run at 23 theaters, with a different ending theme and paired with Pokemon 4D Pikachu's Ocean Adventure. There were also reruns in 2017 and 2020, but the short hasn't had any home media release and remains mostly lost to this day. One thing we do have is a short teaser thanks to YouTube user ChainswordCS, who uploaded it to their channel on August 24th, 2020. Since I just mentioned it in the previous entry, I figured I should just get it out of the way, right? Anyways, it's the second 3D short that was shown in 4D. It shows Pikachu going on a vacation, only to find a Chadot, who brings him on a quest, a hunt to find the treasure Whale Lord's Tear. The show had limited runs in Japan starting in 2006, then later dubbed into English and shown at the IMAX 3D Theater at Jordan's Furniture in Avon, Massachusetts. Now, why is there an IMAX theater in a furniture store? No clue, but okay. Distributed by SimX iWorks, it played at the theater for a while before it went missing, and the company says they have since lost the rights to the film, making it harder to track down now that it's in limbo. It has since re-aired in 2017 and 2020, but hasn't resurfaced since. Some footage and teasers can be found online along with the poster, but for now, both of these shorts are considered partially found. After reading some comments from those who saw it, it sounded like quite the experience seeing it in theaters, and I have hope that they will both resurface someday. Pokemon Live was a live-action musical based on Ash and Friends in the original 151. It was roughly 90 minutes long and toured the US between September 2000 to January 2001. It was produced by 4Kids, Nintendo, and Radio City Entertainment. A professional recording is known to exist, both by word of mouth of those in the audience during the Chicago show, and it was scheduled to air both on TV and released on home media. Yet these plans didn't work out and all we have to show is bootlegs and no official recording. The musical centers on Ash and friends going to a mysterious gym to earn a diamond badge, which is an evil plan by Giovanni, boss of Team Rocket. He created Mecha Mewtwo and wanted to use them for world domination. Sounds like something Giovanni would do, even though I would argue he likes to be in the shadows more and something this loud is kind of out of character for him, but let me know your thoughts on it. Pokemon Life featured both live-action characters and Pokemon, along with some string-controlled puppets. A DVD release was teased on the Pokemon website at the time of the show's tour, but it's assumed that the plans went cancelled after the UK tour was cancelled for quote, unforeseen circumstances. YouTuber Chadtronic's video, titled The Mystery of Pokemon Live, reignited interest in the show that had been mostly forgotten since its end in 2001. Thanks to him, this production gained new attention. In the video, Chadtronic had the chance to speak with Chris Mitchell, the production stage manager who was responsible for the seven-part bootleg. Mitchell believed that a lack of interest and money problems were why the show went missing, saying, the Pokemon craze was not as big in 2000 as it was in 1999, end quote. He later confirmed that the high-quality recording existed, but that it was lost in the archives of whoever had the rights at the time, and they had tried many times to get a copy but was unsuccessful. Due to this, Chadtronic started the hashtag FindPokemonLive and encourages anyone with information on the show to reach out to him. We do have some promotional material like Brock's English voice actor talking about the DVD release, and the script has also been found. Since then, nothing more of the Chicago recording has resurfaced, and interest in finding it has died down with no leads. But maybe with a few more people and oomph, it may be possible to find. While the US show is currently missing, some international versions have been found, like the Dubai performance that was found in October 2016. It was uploaded by the actor for Ash, in response to the popularity of Pokemon Go. This performance is different from the US version, though. The Dubai performance was a mix of people working together, which is cool to see, with costumes coming from the USA, sound effects and music from a British company, and the cast and crew all being Australian. The Mexican show was known as, and I'm sorry that I'm going to butcher this, Pokemon El Espectaculo in Vivo, translates to Pokemon the Live Show, was shown for one day on May 27, 2001 at the National Auditorium in Mexico City, and aired on Canal 9, mostly known as Canal Nueve, a channel that combined programming from different channels and countries, in August 2001 for two hours. On February 16th, 2020, YouTube user The Cooler Ya Mask uploaded a 99.8 version to the YouTube channel, leaving out the anime sections of the show due to copyright concerns, but they later uploaded the whole show to the Internet Archive on March 22nd, 2020. In March 2002, following the Mexican show, the Pokemon Al Vivo tour concluded in Lisbon, Portugal, running from March 21st to March 27th. 
A six minute clip was uploaded to Craner X's slash Claudio's channel in 2011, but has since been deleted along with five other videos about the show on their channel for unknown reasons. And that's all we seem to have so far for Pokemon Live. While we have a bootleg to enjoy, I know many people, including me, want to see the official recording. I think it's possible if enough people were asking, or maybe a petition to show the rights holders that it isn't forgotten, and it is an important piece of Pokemon history. Pokemon Crystal was released for the Game Boy Color in 2000 for Japan and worldwide in 2001. It was an enhanced version of Pokemon Gold and Silver, with noticeable upgrades, added storylines, and more. While it was quite an upgrade for every player, Japan's version had even more possibilities. There, they had an accessory for their Game Boy Color or Game Boy known as the Mobile Adapter GB, which could attach to their mobile phone and console, letting them play multiplayer online or download extra content. It wasn't released outside of Japan due to cell phones not being as common or advanced as they were there. On Goldoran City, the Pokemon Center has been replaced with the innovative Pokemon Communication Center, or also known as the Pokecom Center. The center offers the unique features of allowing you to trade and battle with your friends, as well as the ability to send items like GS Balls, Blue Sky Mail, and Mirage Mail. Furthermore, you can access newspaper articles from the Pokemon News Machine, and it had mini games too! like Chico Dice and a quiz hosted by Chico, and the only information I know about her is that she is a time-traveling girl. Sounds kind of familiar, but... you know. <laughs> However, these games were hidden by a 100 yen paywall, but they went missing along with the other content when the service was shut down on December 14th, 2002. The data for the content was stored within Pokemon's RAM, supported by a shoddy battery that would drain and empty quickly. However, there have been attempts to emulate the Mobile GB and restore the missing data. It's unlikely that any mobile patches are still functional or even exist today. But there is a Poke Community Daily article that goes more in depth, so if you're interested, go check it out. Pokemon Dream World was a Bowser based game connected to Pokemon Black and White and Pokemon Black 2 and White 2, operating under the Pokemon Global Link site. This game allowed players to send in a Pokemon to get items and meet new Pokemon, most similar to like a Gen 5 version of the Pokewalker. Dreamworld opened on September 18th, 2010, but shut down on January 14th, 2014, along with all other online services for Gen 5 games, making accessing the game impossible. Before entering, international players would need an account with Pokemon.com, Pokemon Daisuke Club for Japanese players, or the Korean Pokemon website for those in Korea. To access it fully, you would have to send your Pokemon using the Sea Gears game sync, and Dreamworld only allowed one copy of Pokemon Black and White to connect to it at a time. If it was your first time playing, you would be given a tutorial by Fennel, a friend of Professor Juniper, and would be given five damage-reducing berries. Due to the traffic, players were only allowed to visit the Dreamworld once every 20 hours, and it had a few features as well, allowing you to customize your own home, a treasure chest where you could store items or send them back to your connected games, a friend board to see which Pokemon are being sent back to the games and ones you've sent before, a garden to grow berries, and a share shelf where you can swap items with other players. There's also a place known as the Island of Dreams where you can meet new Pokemon and obtain items, although most are pre-gen 5 Pokemon. Areas are unlocked as a player earns dream points and each area has different requirements and might have held specific types of Pokemon. After finding Pokemon, there is an option to play a minigame to befriend it. Players could also become dream pals with other players, making it quite an interactive experience outside of Pokemon Black and White. It's disappointing that the service is no longer usable, but there are pictures and videos out there showing it off. Set to air on January 6, 1998, the episode was cancelled after an episode aired out of order, but it was supposed to sum up all episodes into holiday hijinks and would have aired right after Snow Way Out. It's unknown how long the special would have been, but I can assume it might have been similar to the other specials at an hour long or so. The episode was cancelled due to the Porygon incident in Pokemon's hiatus, and a different version of the special aired later, on October 5, 1998, but the clip version hasn't yet surfaced. Information on the special is pretty scarce, and there isn't much evidence of its existence, but I end up noticing a trend of these special slash clip shows not airing in the US, and I wasn't able to find a reason as to why. For now, it remains fully lost. 
In a secret underground chamber, a strange and ancient Pokemon race exists, more mysterious than you. Pokemon 3 The Movie, also known as Lord of the Unknown Tower, debuted in July 2000 in Japan and nearly a year later in the US during April 2001. And like the first movie, there is speculation and truths about it being different than originally planned. And the late Takashi Shudo, the writer behind the first draft, had a wild plan for the third film. He spent half a year writing a Jurassic Park meets Pokemon extravaganza, where the question of what happened to the real world animals and why Pokemon exist were explored. In it, a fossil of a T-Rex was discovered and brought back to life, who responds by going on a rampage throughout the Kanto region, and Ash and Friends and even Team Rocket would have worked together to end its reign of terror. Despite the amount of work put into the draft, producers didn't greenlight it, saying that a story where a bunch of minerals gain consciousness and comes to life won't be a hit. And that's all we knew for a while until a story about what happened to the script showed up on Dagasu's backpack. And while most people believe the story, some are skeptical. Going to their blog, they have a short blurb about what happened, and it says, quote, The original script was discovered and auctioned off for 1 billion yen, about 8 million US dollars, to someone in their 30s going by the name of Sue. Will this version of the film ever see the light of day? Only time will tell, end quote. And this was believed for quite a while, though other people, including myself, were skeptical. After reading this, I remembered a conversation I had with Sakura Stardust about how the story is far from true, so I reached out to her and asked her what she thought about it all. We concluded it's all false. There must have been some confusion or miscommunication along with a poorly translated article. The Sioux, mentioned by Dagusu's backpack, is referencing one of the most infamous and well-preserved T-Rex fossils, Sioux. The script is most likely never sold in auction and was posted on Shudo's blog. Now that we know this blurb is false, it puts into question why it can still be found on the blog, but I'm not here to discredit Dagasu's backpack. I used it as a source throughout this video, and their hard work throughout decades preserving Pokemon history is admirable. Nonetheless, it's a little strange, and I'm not quite sure how to feel about it. I tried looking for the post with the script, but it was unsuccessful, but I'm sure there's someone out there who knows more Japanese than I do and can find the script, and hopefully this mystery can be solved. But for now, the script is considered lost. Pokemon Trading Card Game 2, The Invasion of Team GR, is a Japan-exclusive sequel to the Pokemon Trading Card Game. It revolves around a new team known as Team Great Rocket and contains nearly all cards from Base Set, Jungle, Fossil, and Team Rocket. Also, it added new cards, the ability to play as a female character, a larger in-game world, and a more fleshed-out story. An IGN article from January 24th, 2001 says this about the cancelled US release. I see your Pikachu and raise you a Charmander. Oh wait, wrong game? Well then I call Jin. According to Japan's Watch and Press, Nintendo has begun work on a second Pokemon trading card game for the Game Boy Color, featuring tons more cards and plenty more challengers. The game is said to be focused on Team Rocket this time around, but 40 more new opponents are also up against you, becoming the ultimate Pokemon card master. Pokemon Trading Card Game 2, The Return of Team Rocket, will have twice the Pokemon trading cards in the game. In addition to new opponents and cards, the game's training mode will be fixed to help gamers understand the complexity of card battling, and now the game will rate your team with a deck diagnosis feature. It's unknown why the game never had an official English release, but unofficial translations made by fans do exist. As far as I know, this game is considered lost and it's unlikely that the official version will ever release, but it's good to know that dedicated fans worked hard to make it available in some way. The Pokemon Pirate Ship Show is one of the most mysterious pieces of Pokemon media other than Pokemon Live. According to Reddit user Darth Cthulhu, they have cracked the mystery, when at first all we had was a few pictures and short magazine articles. Anyways, it was a Team Rocket show during the Pokemon 2000 World Championship in Sydney, Australia. When one of the articles was translated, it said this, Pokemon battle in the middle of Sydney Bay, as you hear and how you can see. Nintendo put on a good show in the middle of the Olympic Bay to welcome Pokemon fans. So big was it organized that there was even a cannon battle between Team Rocket and the group of Pokemon that had to prevent the bad guys from stealing the champion's trophy. The Pokemon won, of course, and the hundreds of thousands of people who had gathered there were left with an unbeatable taste. This was just the preamble to Pokemon Park. Imagine what happened next. Pictures of the event can be found in the Italian Pokemon World magazine from December 2000 and are available on archive.org, uploaded by Play Press Publishing. According to other comments from people that were at the championship, this was an opening day show. No recording of the event is known to exist, but I think Nintendo Australia might have it buried somewhere, or maybe not. 
Highly recommend checking out Mew Me's video on the topic though if you want to hear more about this lost treasure. Back in 2010, the anime featured the Yanova region in Best Wishes, premiering on September 23rd, 2010. During its first run, there was supposed to be a two-part episode known as Rocket Dan vs. Plasma Dan, translated to Team Rocket vs. Team Plasma, revolving around the two evil teams fighting over Meteorite. The episodes went unaired after the 2011 Tohoku earthquake, tsunami, and Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant meltdown, as the events in the episode were similar to the disaster. Because of this, Team Plasma would not appear in the anime until the back end of Best Wishes. According to Pokemon's English dub director Tom Wayland, the episodes were sent to the Pokemon Company International, but the redubbing process hadn't begun before its cancellation. There are screenshots available and footage from the episodes has been reused in other episodes, but it's unlikely that we'll see them, due to the same reasoning I mentioned before when talking about Battle of the Quaking Island Barbaroach vs. Wishcash. But wait, there's more. On March 12th, 2011, the day after the Tohoku tsunami, TV Tokyo had promised online that they would air the episodes at a later date, but never gave a specific day. Initial plans likely changed due to the Black 2 and White 2 games and their version of Team Plasma being adapted into anime instead. As of Team Plasma's Pokemon Power Plot, the episode has been removed from continuity. And more news as I'm writing the script, the scripts have been found and are in the process of being translated, so I'm happy to have some good news here. Now, this one encompasses three different Mystery Dungeon games, Keep Going Blazing Adventure Squad, Let's Go Stormy Adventure Squad, and Go For It Light Adventure Squad, or known collectively as the Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Adventure Squad series. They are a set of WiiWare games, well, for the Nintendo Wii. Each game originally cost 1,200 Wii points, but was changed to 1,234 Wii points. They were released exclusively in Japan on August 4th, 2009, making them the only Mystery Dungeon games to not have a worldwide release. The game has the mythical god of Pokemon, Arceus, and focuses on either water, fire, or electric type Pokemon depending on which version the player had, and they weren't as plot-centered as previous iterations of Mystery Dungeon. Unfortunately, the games are unobtainable after we were shut down on January 31st, 2019, but here's what we do now. Some features of the game include using the same models from My Pokemon Ranch and the Pokemon Rumble series, the DS could be used as a controller, special missions could be downloaded, and Pokemon could evolve inside of dungeons. There's also a new mechanic known as Pokemon Tower, allowing Pokemon to ride on each other and do simultaneous attacks as if they were one Pokemon. And finally, it was the first Mystery Dungeon game where a human doesn't turn into a Pokemon. But I do have a plot breakdown as per Bulbapedia. It begins with an overview of the hub location and Farfetch'd is seen fighting Sneasel, Floatzel, or Grumpig until the fight is broken by an Elder Slowking. After that, Aeron and Swinob approach Slowking asking for someone to rescue a Shuckle. The game starts when Slowking asks for help, and you can choose your starter. Most of the game is spent taking on dungeons to rescue Pokemon, and in the end, the team shares some special cookies with the quarreling Pokemon and Elder Slowking in the town, showing a happy ending. I should also probably say, 36 different shiny Pokemon species can be found in the game, yet the available Pokemon are different depending on which version a player has. To conclude this section, these games are considered lost, but there's a chance they could be brought back, albeit in a different way. My Pokemon Ranch is a WiiWare title announced on October 7, 2007 at Nintendo's Fall Conference. It really wasn't a game, but more of an accessory or a DLC for people playing Pokemon Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum. It was developed by Umbrella and was purchasable for 1,000 Wii points. Pokemon from the DS games could be transferred onto a farm, and a player could use up to 8 different copies of the games to send their Pokemon and organize them with factors like height and weight. Players could also interact with up to 1,000 Pokemon. The firm and ranch was owned by Haley, a friend of BB's, where she can provide info on your Pokemon differing from the main series games. She would also bring a new Pokemon to the ranch each day, but as you earn milestones, she would bring more, and she would ask what type to bring next. My Pokemon Ranch is mostly known as a Gen 4 version of Pokemon Box, while its function was mostly like Pokemon Battle Revolution, due to it only interacting with certain save files. So only the saves that provided the Pokemon to the ranch could withdraw them or else they would be lost preventing people from storing Pokemon for new games, something previous storage software was known for. On November 5th, 2008, my Pokemon Ranch was updated to work with Pokemon Platinum, yet it wasn't released internationally. This made the game incompatible with Platinum without the update. 
Unfortunately, the service was no longer obtainable after Wii Shop's channel shut down. The blurb for the service is as follows. The Pokemon phenomenon debuts on WiiWare with My Pokemon Ranch, a game that lets you watch as Pokemon and Miis interact with each other for the first time. Enjoy the relaxing ranch life by viewing your ranch and its Pokemon, taking pictures, and sending those pictures to your friends via the Wii message board. The more Pokemon and Miis that you bring to your ranch, the more fun it becomes. The game received negative criticism for its Mii art style, a lack of interaction, and the big one, of course, needing a copy of Pokemon Pearl or Diamond in order to use it. IGN called this the ugliest Pokemon game to hit any video game system, and I'll call it what it is. Lost. After the release of Sun and Moon, Eurogamer reported that on November 18th, 2016, that they had heard that there was a game known as Pokemon Stars in development, with a projected release in early 2017. It was going to be similar to when the DS had three main series releases, but on the 3DS. It would have featured new Pokemon and graphic enhancements. The rumors swirled more when Pokemon released merchandise around Stars, and eventually an Amazon listing popped up. But on June 6, 2017, Ultra Sun and Moon were announced, and it's thought that Pokemon Stars was implemented into it in some way. I forgot to mention that this was supposed to come out on the Switch. While the project never materialized, no Pokemon game to the Switch until Let's Go Eevee and Pikachu were released in November 2018. It's assumed that Nintendo's business strategy was to blame for its cancellation, or the blowout success of the Switch and the subsequent supply and demand issues may also be to blame. No materials have leaked from the game, and it's unlikely that we will ever see anything about it since it's unknown whether any kind of demo or prototype exists. In addition, I joined the Bulbapedia Discord server, which is a great server by the way, to ask their thoughts on whether the game even existed, since I was skeptical after researching this topic for a while. The answer I got? They also believe the game didn't exist, and I guess Pokemon Stars will always be a mystery. The reporter behind the information is known to be reputable, so why would he make something up? Who were his sources? Why are Pokemon developers held down by NDAs that make it so they can't discuss anything pertaining to this project? We may never know, and while I don't think this game is real, it very well could be, and I really want to know what you guys think. Toon.com is a website from the 2000s made by Endymi and Ad Tools. Their main focus was sending Toon cards through email that would feature different children's media franchises, like Pokemon, Pee Wee's Playhouse, and various old school cartoons. I see them as a more family-friendly version of desktop pets. The cards had little animation and MIDI soundtracks, but many went missing after the shite was shut down in 2005. Most have been found though thanks to internet archives. The known missing cards are Secret Pokemon Toon Card, made to promote the first Pokemon movie, but it's unknown what Pokemon was featured as the link was never archived and was obtainable after getting the Pikachu, Charizard, and Mew and Mewtwo cards. The last of the Pokemon cards is the Pokemon the Movie 2000 card, which I assume was Lugia, but I could be wrong. And info is pretty scarce since the download link is now broken and no archives are known to exist. Due to the vast majority being found, I'm hopeful that these will be found someday, but for now, they are considered lost and Toon cards as a whole are partially lost. Pocket Monster 64 is an unreleased Nintendo 64 disk drive title, and would have been the first Pokemon RPG coming before Pokemon Colosseum and Pokemon XD Gale of Darkness. Little info on the game exists besides its first mention in a June 1997 issue of Electronic Gaming Monthly with Shigeru Miyamoto, then Radio Silence, and it's unknown why the game was cancelled, but it could be the disk drive failing massively, Pokemon working on other games, or Junuchi Masuda, a major developer for Game Freak, believing that Pokemon role-playing games didn't belong on home consoles. It had a very small team of 10 working on it, which could also be a factor, but it would have been compatible with trading Game Boy Pokemon. An archive of N64.com from June 5, 1997 says this about the game. Whether Nintendo's announcement of Pocket Monsters for 64DD will move a load of systems and make Nintendo immensely popular in Japan again is still an unknown quantity. But one thing is for sure. The game will sell simultaneously in Japan with Mario Paint 64, Earthbound 64, and SimCity 64 as part of the launch titles for 64DD. Will the game arrive in the US? Nintendo has not announced this yet, and it's a flip of the coin, but the game hasn't seen US shelves ever. 
We'll find out more on this one in the near future. Pocket Monsters originally started out as a Hanafuda card game and is still selling. It stands as the fourth RPG for Nintendo or its 64DD add-on. Your mission in Pocket Monsters, which by the way is not a reference to sexual organs, is to capture all of the monsters, of which there are 100 plus, and complete the monster guidebook. Interesting twists make this game more difficult than one would expect and a great challenge. There may be no plans to bring this game to the US at all, but the significance of Pocket Monsters arriving on 64D as a launch title suggests that Nintendo is once again relying on its previous library to bolster its oncoming add-on the 64DD. An extra set of worlds contained in one disc of Zelda 64 is far more likely bet as part of the launch titles than Pocket Monsters for the US, but with Nintendo, who knows? And that article is all we really have for the game, and it's unlikely we'll see anything more as we do have other games already for the Nintendo 64. And the disc drive has a load of lost games, so that's a whole other issue. But Sakura Stardust did make a video on the topic, and I recommend checking that out if you want to know more than I went on over here. But I'm open to covering the topic if y'all are interested. Anyways, before I ramble on and on, Pocket Monster 64 is lost, and most likely will be for the foreseeable future. An investigation's underway in Japan into why more than 600 children suffered from convulsions and vomiting after watching a television cartoon program. It's thought that Bright... One of the most infamous pieces of Pokemon history, Computer Warrior Porygon slash Electric Soldier Porygon, premiered on December 16th, 1997 in Japan. But most people know about this episode. It centers on Ash entering an out-of-order Pokeball transmitting device to figure out what's wrong, and as usual, Team Rocket is to blame. They were the cause of the problem and were out to steal Pokemon, like Porygon. The episode is most infamous for a scene about halfway through, in which Pikachu uses Thunderbolt to attack a virus within the system, causing it to explode into a shower of blue and red flashing lights. This scene caused people to experience blurriness, headaches, nausea, and in some extreme cases, seizures. After the episode aired, the show went on a four-month hiatus, and the episode was banned from ever rerunning. While the Japanese episode is available in some form, an English dub is not surfaced. Ash's English voice actor said that no dub has ever created, but this contradicts information from the late voice actor of Meowth, Maddie Blaustein, who said that there was a finished dubbed episode. Pokemon PC Master was a computer education game developed by Umbrella and released in Japan on June 20th, 2006. Its main focus was teaching children to use a computer, such as using the mouse, typing, browsing, and other basic computer skills. For unknown reasons, the website PokemonPCMaster.com went dark a year later and the domain was taken over by someone else. A lot about this game is mysterious, with little information to go off of. A trial version is known to exist, and was thankfully found in January 2018 by someone known as Terada XXD01 to Mediafire, and is available to those who want to check out this odd Pokemon game. But this find helped us give us some clues. I would compare Pokemon PC Master to something like ABC Mouse, where a paid subscription or educational connection is needed to access everything it has to offer, but I still found it strange how it only lasted a year or under a year before it was lost. For now, Pokemon PC Master, the full version, is lost, but we do have a promo available to watch, some photos of what it looked like, and an archive of the website from December 2006. Despite the mysterious disappearance of Pokemon PC Master, we can be confident that the game helped many Japanese children learn basic computer skills. Additionally, the trial version found in 2018 helps us to gain a better understanding of the game and its features. Pokemon Pink was a planned entry for the main series of games planned sometime in the late 90s and would have served as the companion to Pokemon Yellow, like Pokemon Red and Blue years earlier. It's unknown how far in development the game was, but proof can be found in Pokemon Yellow source code. This includes headers named Pocket Monsters Pink and Yellow and other files with pink in the title. And Pokemon Pink wouldn't even be known to the public without the April 11th, 2020 Nintendo Giga Leak. This Giga Leak provided an unprecedented amount of information across Nintendo's library of games, including Pokemon Yellow and Pink, proving that it must have been further in development than the planning stage and ultimately cancelled. It first appeared on 4chan, and it opened the door for speculation as to what the game might have been. Maybe the lead was a female character and was more targeted towards girls, or that it would have had a singular starter like Pokemon Yellow, yet people are divided on whether it would have been Jigglypuff or Clefairy. This, of course, is all just speculation, since Nintendo hasn't acknowledged the existence of this game in any way, and no other evidence of its existence has been uncovered yet.
2005, in the Nakamura Ward of Nagoya, Japan, they held the Poke Park, an event dedicated to Pokemon. I'm assuming to celebrate its massive success both worldwide and in Japan. Throughout the park were DS download PlayStations where players could install Poke Park Asari Takai, which translates to Poke Park Fish and Rally DS. In it, you would fish for water type Pokemon at many locations, and leaderboards were set up to see where you matched up against other players that day, and up to five caught Pokemon could be kept at one time. The DS also needed to be held horizontally to play. The unfortunate problem with this was the temporary nature of DS download play, making it so the game was deleted slash wiped from the system's memory if the DS was shot off or 12 hours had passed. The only data left was the leaderboards on their servers, but I can imagine this frustrated many players who wanted to go back and see their Pokemon, or just challenge themselves to beat high scores. For a while, no ROM was known to exist, though that since changed due to Tim Sherwagon, and I'm sure I really butchered that, I'm so sorry, uploading footage, which has since been privated, that was re-uploaded to Chainsword CS's YouTube channel, and he also has a website that gives a little more info about it, which I thought I'd break down for y'all today. According to Chainsword CS, the realm was found anonymously and made playable through Firefly, posted sometime between August 24th and September 20th, 2005, and that this was the realm Tim had and is believed to be the Japanese Pokemon Center version, although alternate versions with slight design differences exist, such as Pokemon Festa 2005, Poke Park Japan, and Poke Park Taiwan. The Pokemon Center ROM is the only one known to exist, the other versions are still lost, but I'd imagine they might be out there somewhere. Now, I need to give credit where it's due, since Chainsword CS dedicated a lot of time documenting information, photos, and archives of this game that were previously lost to time. The Pokemon Planetarium specials have a long and complicated history, but they are truly something special when compared to the anime series, video games, or Pokemon cards. Seven specials have released over the years, starting in 2004 with Pocket Monsters Advanced Generation Planetarium The Challenge from the Skies, and the most recent one, Pocket Monster is The Message from the Aurora, in August of 2020. None of these specials have ever released on home media, due to the nature of their production and how a movie for a planetarium just wouldn't look right on a TV screen or whatever kind of device you're using to watch at home. To round out this video, I thought I'd compile all of them into one chapter, so let's dive in, or should I say, let's blast off! Challenge from the Sky is the first of seven specials, premiering at the Kanaka Minolta Planetarium through July 17, 2004 to September 12, 2004, with tickets costing 800 yen, or 580 in USD, for adults, and 500 yen, or $3.62 US dollars, for children age 4 to elementary school age, which I'm guessing is around 10 or 11 years old. There isn't much information out there on the show, but we do know a revolved around Ash and Pikachu adventuring when they are swallowed by darkness where they meet the galactic Dark Lord, who is hellbent on stealing Pokemon like Team Rocket. Ash and Pikachu decide to stop him, and that's pretty much it. The show itself is 30 minutes long, but was an original story for the show, projected onto a dome-like ceiling and making quite an experience with full surround sound and images coming from every direction. The first half of the special has a lecture explaining where some of the most notable stars could be found, and in the other half a Q&A from the Pokemon characters to the audience watching. All I could find of the show were some posters, but archives of the Planetarium's website from back in 2004 might exist to give more of an idea of what it looked like at the time. Get Together Pokemon Planet Center, also known as Pocket Monsters Diamond and Pearl Gather Around the Pokemon Planet Center, is the second special, premiering first at the previously mentioned Kanaka Minolta Planetarium from July 15, 2006 to August 31, 2006. It aired again at Angel Land from July 9, 2007 to September 9, 2007. The posters and some information on the special can be found on Dagosu's backpack, and the synopsis is short and sweet but is as follows. Hey everyone, I'm Satoshi. Have you ever looked up at the night sky and gazed at the stars floating up there? Just like with Pokemon, the star-studded sky has lots and lots of mysteries. The Pokemon Planet Center is a place where you can solve some of the mysteries of space together with Pikachu, so let's all get together at the Pokemon Planet Center. For now, a lot of the special is a mystery.
Gather around the Pokemon Star Festival centered around Ash, Dawn, and Brock taking part in the Star Festival, but as events begin, Pokemon start to vanish, even Ash's own Pikachu. And the hosts of the event are familiar, but what are their plans? Certainly, they are up to no good. The special aired for the first time at the Saitama City Space Theater from May 31st to August 31st, 2008, and we ran through a few other museums. Then it aired for the last time at Jifu Science Museum from June 7th, 2008 to May 31st, 2009. It differed from the previous specials by being 8 minutes shorter than the usual 30 minutes, and featured 112 slides with some animation attached. Posters and some info are available online, though. <laughs> Also known as the Celestial Globe of Light and Shadow, according to Bulbapedia, it aired from July 6, 2011 to August 31, 2011. The show featured Ash, Iris, and Cylon from the Innova region. The plot centered around Team Rocket trying to nab Pikachu like they've done countless times before, and Ash and friends chase after them where they find the ruins of an armillary sphere which is a 3D modeled object that displays the celestial latitude and longitude in the path of the sun. From there, a light show in the sky begins, and the group of friends must work together to save both their Pokémon and others stolen by the Sneaky Stealers. Visitors who attended the show also went home with a clear file, so that could have been used for school or for adding to your Pokémon collection. But this is the first special to have a trailer reappear, and that can be found on IFSB's YouTube channel. In the special, Ash, Serena, Clement, and his little sister Bonnie go to PAXA, the Pokemon Aerospace Exploration Agency, where they learn about the wonder of space and the impact that space debris has on space travel, and that it could cut off their path to the cosmos. After the presentation, Team Rocket arrives to rob the place and a satellite malfunctions, threatening to add on to the growing debris problem. So Ash and his companions need to work together to stop Team Rocket and save PAXA from making space travel impossible. The show was 40 minutes long and featured a presentation about the summer sky, and aired at two Kanaka Minolta planetariums, one in Sunshine City and the other in Tokyo Skytree Town from July 12, 2014 to September 7, 2014. As far as evidence goes, we do have an account from Dogusu's Backpacks viewing and a press release along with the posters, but not much else has surfaced since. This special, as the name shows, takes place during the release of the seventh generation, Sun and Moon. It centers around Ash and his friend Sophocles setting out to view a solar eclipse on Eclipse Island. There, they meet a friend, a self-described eclipse hunter. However, when the time comes, it's cloudy, so they need to travel up a mountain where they come across Team Rocket attempting to catch rare Pokemon that only appear during eclipses, but have to sneak out of a beware den in order to complete their evil plan. The main fight takes place during the eclipse, and Ash and Sophocles are left trying to end it before the eclipse is over. One cool thing though, an eclipse happened the same year the show premiered, and it was a total solar eclipse throughout most of the US on August 21st, and a partial eclipse in Hawaii, the state the Alola region is based on. The first airing was shown at the Yamaguchi General Children's Center from September 10th, 2017 to September 30th of the same year. It would air several more times at different locations before its final run at the Dream 21 Children's Hall in Osaka, Japan, starting April 9th, 2019, and ending sometime at the end of May 2019. There are posters and accounts from those who have seen it, and a reception on these specials is very mixed, some enjoying the creativity and the spectacle of it, and some saying they are cheaply made and not worth it. The final special I'm going to talk about today, this one aired most recently on August 20th, 2020, at the Toyohashi Planetarium and ending its run at Discovery Park Yaizu on August 31st, 2021. The synopsis on Dogosu's backpack is pretty short, so I'll read it to y'all. Word has it that whenever the sun enters a new solar cycle, that there's a chance the so-called Aurora Pokémon, the legendary Pokémon Suicune itself, will make an appearance. Ash and Go head towards Aurora Village as research fellows from the Cerise Laboratory in order to look up into the connection between Suicune and the Auroras. There, they meet a girl named Emma, whose father is an Aurora researcher, as well as the many Pokémon who live out there in the snowy fields. But Team Rocket appear before Ash and the others to get Pikachu. Will our heroes be able to reach the Auroras and meet Suicune after all? 
You can find a review for the show on Dogusu's backpack along with some more information, which I didn't know this was planned to be released in autumn 2020, but it might have been delayed before its premiere date. Other than that, it sits at the same table as the other specials, not having any sort of home media release and little outside evidence. While researching this video, I came across many topics I've never seen mentioned anywhere else. These topics lacked an article to go off of or had so little information that I thought writing a whole entry for them wouldn't work. As such, I thought it would be appropriate to mention them here in the honorable mentions, even though they have been lost as well. But I also need to say that some of these articles probably don't have them for a reason, so their existence should be taken with a grain of salt. Anyways, here they are. The Pokemon X and Y Southern Region story, Pokemon Treta Lab for the Nintendo 3DS US version, Pokemon It Takes Two promo commercial from the early 2000s, Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Gold Rescue Team Challenge to Gold Rank, and finally, the lost soundtrack from the Pokemon Sun and Moon Legendaries trailer. Hi, it's me in my little editing sphere, I guess. Um, so there are a couple things that I missed that I kind of wanted to briefly go, go over or touch on. So the first thing that I missed was the Pokemon 2000 Adventure game, which was not developed by Nintendo. It was developed by Cyberworld Propriety Cuborg Technology? which was good at displaying, you know, 2D-ish environments, and it was like a any other, like, kind of classic adventure game at the time. You know, you get to pick a name, choose your team, and select your own difficulty, and you travel. You would travel to the three islands that, you know, are guarded by the three legendary birds, you know, Moltres, Zapdos, Articuno. Iconic, right? <laughs> and... Retrieve, retrieve an ancient spear, and you know there are different obstacles you'd have to overcome throughout the game. And once you completed it, you'll get a certificate at the end. And I'll definitely include some pictures of it, probably over top of me, so you guys can get an idea of what it looked like. But this game was taken down because Nintendo told Cyberworld that they had to, <laughs> which is very uh, makes sense, I guess, for them. Um, based on things that have happened recently, things that have happened in the past, as far as how Nintendo works. Um, but I don't want to, like, give too much... I don't want Nintendo to come after me for this video, at least I hope they don't. Um, I really like a lot of the things that Nintendo does, but I really don't like a lot some of, some of the actions that they take. And, um, I think that's okay to say. And... As far as availability for this goes, um, Cody Burns of Every Game Ever released a video with an interview with one of the developers, and it kind of shed light on the development a little bit, and that, that a CD was found with a much more like completed version of the game, and then a recording of a playthrough. So. Pokemon 2000 Adventure Game is listed as partially found as per the Lost Media Wiki, and also there is a there was there not is there was a comment left on one of my community posts saying that my script was done. So, Crush Beast 29 here said, "Looking forward to it. Also, did you know the original Mew event in Japan is basically Lost Media?" And I didn't really have a lot of time to look into this, but I thought I would just put it in. And if anyone else has any information that they could give about this event, please let me know down below and I can maybe update it in an another video or make a community post giving more clear information because I wasn't, I didn't really have the time to dive, dive into it since I was more focused on getting this video edited. And it's been, it's been a journey, that's for sure. I've never really tackled a video that's been this long, so I appreciate each and every one of you that have watched it to this point, or even watch it fully to the end after the outro and everything. So, it's been fun. It's I've been gone for way too long, and I really hope to be more consistent. But, you know, I've just been having a lot of trouble with mental health struggles, personal life, things that have been going on that I don't really feel like diving into right now. Um, there are will be times that I'll probably go over it a little bit more in the future, maybe in live streams, maybe on Twitter. Um, I just feel like a full video on my channel is maybe not the place for it since I 
mostly talk about lost media and I don't know how many of you guys are actually like wanting to hear about my personal life because I don't know I, I like having my little opinions and stuff in there but the, vi the video is not about me it's about the lost media so <laughs> um yeah so I just wanted to include those and just let me know you guys' thoughts and thank you guys for sticking around I appreciate you all Roll the outro now, <laughs> please. And that wraps up Lost Media Log Pokemon. This video was a challenge research-wise, and while I spent a lot of time trying to put information together, I had a lot of fun digging into some of my favorite pieces on the list, and most I've never heard of or those I know existed but didn't look too much into them for one reason or another. Before I end the video, I want to thank Sakura Stardust for helping me with the information with the original Pokemon 3, the original draft, and her video also inspired me to make this, so I highly recommend checking out her channel. I also want to thank the Bulbapedia Discord for answering some questions I had regarding Pokemon Stars, and for being an awesome community-driven wiki working hard to document Pokemon's history. And that's all, I suppose. Let me know your thoughts down below and what you want to see me cover next. Leave a like and subscribe, but only if you want to. And I hope you all have a fantastic day.